Today I want to talk to you about the benefits of cardiovascular training and getting involved as a personal trainer in helping your clients improve their ability to process oxygen, their ability to go long distances, and you know what, their ability to go faster as well. So let's start by first of all talking about what cardiovascular training really is. Cardiovascular training is getting this wonderful heart muscle that we have inside our chest, the most important muscle in our body, and getting it fit and getting it healthy, and doing it using science and sound applications. So let's start by looking at the uh, PowerPoint, and we're going to cover uh, the benefits first of cardiovascular training. And there are lots of them. The list is so long, I can't begin to describe it. And it goes everywhere from improving your aerobic capacity, the ability to use oxygen, increasing your VO2 max, your volume of oxygen. But far beyond that, it has to do with substrate utilization, the type of calories that we're burning when we exercise. You really want to become, and your clients really want to become, fat-burning machines. And the best way I know to do that is get cardiovascular fit. And there's other benefits, and uh, the benefits emotionally and psychologically are tremendous. And current research is showing that cardiovascular training really improves the brain and the functioning of the brain, and keeping a brain uh, active and alive for a long, long time. And the other part I really like about cardiovascular training is it's fun. You know, the social component of having a training partner and working out in groups or being on a team or setting a goal and accomplishing something that may be just outside your comfort zone is one of the most powerful parts of CV cardiovascular training. Let's look at some of the science now behind what happens when we work this powerful muscle that we have. Sure enough, your resting heart rate, that's your heart rate when you're completely still. When you first wake up in the morning, it will drop because it, that is one of the tests for improved fitness. You're also your stroke volume, the amount of blood that your heart is going to pump is going to increase. And as it increases, your cardiac output also increases. Therefore, your heart rate, which is one of the best ways of measuring cardiovascular fitness, is going to decrease. So there's times you want that heart rate to go up, and there's times when you want it to go down. There's times intensity goes up, heart rate goes up. It's measured in beats per minute using a little wrist heart rate monitor or the new um, Gymbotrons, which are projecting heart rate on the wall, or the embedded ones that are in cardiovascular uh, equipment is how it is I'm going to encourage you to monitor and measure and manage your cardiovascular training. And also, you're going to improve your ability to process oxygen. That's called oxygen transport. And by doing that, you're going to burn more fat. Because for fat to burn, oxygen has to be present. So I want you to stay in these low zones, the aerobic zones, so that you can accomplish that. So there are a, a central and peripheral responses that happen when you do cardiovascular training. And that is um, uh, increases in your uh, blood cell counts and your hemoglobin and the amount of blood that's flowing and your peripheral capillaries. It's going to reduce your blood pressure and it's a measurable reduction as well as improve your respiratory response to different intensities of exercises. And respiratory response is, is in large part both your breathing rate and the amount of oxygen that you're going to consume with each breath. There's also a huge change that happens in your metabolism when you start getting cardiovascularly fit. And that metabolism is key for more than just weight loss, for your personal energy and for your ability to go um, sustain a high energy day. That's called the endurance component to this. So the very first thing is there's these little tiny uh, mechanisms inside every single muscle cell called a mitochondria. And sometimes they have a nickname, the energy factory. And the mitochondria, which are going to burn the, the caloric, the, the, the carbohydrates and the fats, and the increase in density, the number of mitochondria that you have. You're also going to be able to extract more oxygen out of each breath. So you're going to be, improve your aerobic capacity. You're going to be able to in, increase the storage inside the muscle, the myoglobin, inside there uh, of how much oxygen you can actually carry. And you're going to improve the amount of glycogen. Glycogen is the 
blood sugar that is inside the muscle the, that you're going to use. Um, and you want to you want to conserve on your glycogen, and you want to really become a fat burner, not a glycogen burner, because in endurance athletics, the fat burners are the ones that do the best. Let's look a, a, a minute at exercise prescription. So what is it as a personal trainer that you have as a responsibility to reduce your risk and to um, enhance your client's experience? So we call that risk stratification. How do we measure the different levels of risk that there are? So for sure, I want to make sure that you administer a PAR-Q test. PAR-Q is just an acronym for Physical Activity Readiness Questionnaire. And it's a simple little instrument that you can do to find out something about your client's risk for uh, cardiovascular incidents. You always want to have in, in uh, informed consent a medical, if you can't, a medical clearance, particularly if they do not pass the PAR-Q test. You want to ask questions about injuries, biomechanical injuries or incidences that they may have, as well as what kind of medications there are. Then I want you to complete a needs analysis. I want you to get a, a biographical history on your client. And because all of us have a limited amount of time to train, it's important that you find out what availability that they have in time and that you create a prescription that fits what is really practical and possible for them. So there are certain principles that all cardiovascular training operate on. We call these foundation principles. And foundation principles are universally accepted by exercise science to explain how does the human body really function. And the FIT formula is one of those foundation, pro, uh, foundation principles. And it, again, is an acronym that stands for frequency, intensity, time. So frequency, how often. Intensity, how hard. Time is how many minutes, the duration of the exercise activity. Type, which is the mode that you're going to be doing. So the type of exercise is, and am I going to be jogging or swimming, or am I going to be using a cardiovascular equipment like a treadmill or an elliptical? And the last E is enjoyment. Cardiovascular to, to, uh, workouts, to, for you to sustain for a long time, need to be fun. And that enjoyment piece is enormous to keep exercise compliance, keeping your clients continuing to stay on the pathway of fitness. Another foundation principle is called specificity, and specificity stands for you have to do specific activities to get your body to respond in specific ways. So specificity starts out with finding out what level of fitness your client is on and what, what their goals are. Is their goal to do a triathlon? Or is their goal simply to um, a process goal, which is to exercise five days a week or get on a program? There are another and the third foundation principle is called the overload principles. And the overload principles is, is one that the way the human body works is that we give it a little bit of load. A load is a measurable quantity of how much exercise you actually get. So, and there's a way to actually give that a value, a numerical number, so that we can track cardiovascular progress. So you're going to give a little bit more load and a little bit more load. And over time, not all, we're going to start at a really low intensity and really low on the principal frequency, intensity, and time and mode, and a little bit more. And you're going to, the body will adapt. And adaptation is a key uh, physiological principle. And there is a point, though, where you, if you give a little bit more load, the overtraining syndrome happens. And overtraining is when I get too much exercise, too much volume, too much of the fit principle. Then there are two different kinds of cardiovascular training. There's aerobic training. And when I'm doing aerobic training, I'm getting my heart rate up. I'm getting into zone one, two, three. But there's a point I can cross over, which is no, is no longer can I sustain it for long periods of time. And that's called threshold, and there's a number of different kinds of thresholds, and we're not going to get into that today, whether it's lactate or ventilatory or anaerobic threshold. But that is a point, and it's very important to know which side I'm on. Am I doing aerobic activity or am I doing high-intensity non-aerobic activity? And there's reversibility, and reversibility is a simple concept that if I don't continue to exercise, I will decondition, and I want to both... At sometimes in my training, I want to get fitter, 
And there's other times that I want to back off on my training and get less fit. Next topic, types of training. Very important in cardiovascular training that you understand the type of workouts that you're doing. And there's a number of different types. One is called continuous training. It's also called steady state training. And in continuing training, I'm going to do my light, light intensity warm up. I'm going to get up to a higher intensity. I'm going to hold that intensity steady. I'm going to hold that heart rate. I'm going to hold that perceived exertion. I'm going to hold that effort. There's lots of ways of describing exercise intensity. The most common is using heart rate because it is an easy um, bio measure that we can uh, manage and look at continuously. But rating of perceived exertion, RPE, is a um, is a another way of measuring exercise intensity, and there's the there's talking and breathing and other in, indexes of what zone you're training in. The next kind of training is called interval training. I love interval training. Interval training is where I have a time where I'm going to go hard and I'm going to recover, where I'm going to stress and I'm going to rest, and it is a typically a ratio of the amount of time and I'm doing high intensity compared to low intensity. So a really good starting interval for a typical cardiovascular, let's say that you're on a treadmill, would be two minutes hard. And hard is somewhere um, for a, a, a level one um, client, a level one client being a beginning, relatively off the couch client, would be to go hard at 70% of their maximum or 80% of their threshold, depending on which of these different training systems, or if you're using another system, which would be using a power meter, which is inside a lot of cardiovascular equipment, it would be about between 60 and 70% of your threshold power. So intervals are um, like two minutes at 70%, and then a recovery of about two minutes at maybe 60%. In this case, let's just use maximum heart rate because maximum heart rate is an, a number that is inside most of cardiovascular equipment. It is based on a formula, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. Another type of training is called fartlek training. And fartlek is a Swedish word, and it means pl speed play. And speed play means I'm going to accelerate. It can be in a swimming pool, on cross-country skis. It could be on my bicycle and in some kind of playful way, and we like to, when we're riding outside, for example, we like to do fart licks to, then to, from stop sign to stop sign, for example. So we'd ride really hard, we'd get to the stop sign, and we would, uh, we would recover. So fart lick can be both aerobic and non-aerobic um, type of workout. I really like this slide. If you will look at it, it's called Exercise Intensity and Substrate Use. And what it is showing is that at diff on the bottom axis is the percent of, of VO2. VO2 means volume of oxygen. The percent of VO2 max, VO2 max is the highest amount of oxygen that you can process. And that maximum number changes. So the fitter I get, the higher my VO2 max. And on the other axis is kilocalories, how many calories I'm burning, total calories. So the height of a column is showing you how many calories I'm burning, in this case, and three different intensity levels. So let's look at the number where it says 25, which is 25% of your VO2 max. You're going to see that when I'm there, I'm burning quite a bit of fat. As a matter of fact, in there, I'm burning about this much carbohydrate, about this much fat, getting about this much protein. And you go, wow, I'm burning a lot of fat. And indeed you are, but you're not very, burning very many total calories. So let's go over to the 65% of VO2 max. That's about 70% of your maximum heart rate. It's kind of hard when you're looking at this graph. It's a common graph that personal trainers look at because it's taken from a, a rather popular source. And, but we can't really prescribe exercise based on percentage of VO2 max because you'd have to have a gas analyzer, a mask on your client's face while they're training to know they're at that number. So what we tend to do and the best thing to do is to look at it as a percentage of an anchor point. In this case, we're going to use maximum heart rate. So that's 65% of VO2 max is about 70% of your maximum heart rate. So maximum heart rate is how fast does this heart beat in one minute? And it's a genetic number. It's not based on age. 
my maximum heart rate when I run, and I love to run, and I love to run long distances, 50, 75, 100 mile races that, that I not only enjoy, I set some records and, and, uh, and win races at. At that level, you're gonna see about an equal uh, amount of glycogen, which is carbohydrates, in the muscle and fat that's being burned. And you might say, wow, I like that. I'm burning more total calories. Of those total calories, I'm burning this much in fat and this much in carbohydrates. That 70 to 80% maximum heart rate is a really, really good place for you to try to get all of your clients. Because if you said, hey, Sally, what do I get the biggest bang for my buck? It's in that zone at 70 to 80%. But now let's go over to 85% of your VO2 max. That's about between 80 and 90% of your max. You're going to burn this many calories, huge number of calories. Of those calories, about this many are sugar, carbohydrate, glycogen, and about this many are fat. So you're going to burn more calories at higher intensity. And you may say, you know, what do I want my client to do? Do I want them to burn? a little bit of fat, or do I want them to burn a lot of calories? And there's no question at all the answer to what the right answer to that question is. Every time you're asked, the answer is always the same. We want your client to burn calories. It is important what kind of calories, but it's more important that they're burning as many calories as they possibly can in the amount of time that you have with them and that you teach them how to burn lots of calories. Um, we're going to now get into a little bit of the deep science and the application of the deep science isn't always immediately evident and it's a concept called EPOC and EPOC may be new to you but it's be going to become more and more popular. It stands for exercise post oxygen <laughs> consumption. I know, I know, that's a little technical at first but let me break it down. So when you exercise, that's the E in exercise. You reach a point where you're aerobic and aerobic, but then there's a point where you get in this state where you go above what is a sustainable. You can't deliver enough oxygen fast enough to be able to meet the demands that the body has for oxygen. So you build up a debt. It's like you're going into your bank account. You've withdrawn all the oxygen, all the money you have. So you're going to go over here and you're going to borrow some of that oxygen. And that debt, that oxygen debt, is cumulative. So I go at higher intensity, there's more debt. Higher intensity, there's more debt. And then there's a point where I'm going to go into my recovery stage of my training, and I'm going to pay back that debt, that oxygen debt. And EPOX is the payment back of the oxygen debt from going at high intensity training. So it, it will become more evident as you progress the value of understanding oxygen debt, how to pay it back, and the best training system to use it. And there are some reasons why training at high intensity, building up oxygen debt <coughs> is really valuable for you. Because by pushing up into high intensity, you're going to burn more calories, you're going to move your threshold, you're going to clear this lactate acid that is a byproduct of exercise metabolism, and you're going to be able to increase your aerobic capacity. The aerobic capacity, I'm going to say it over and over again, is the ability to increase the amount of oxygen that you can utilize per milliliter per kilogram of body weight. Uh, one of my favorite topics, if you look at the slide, is on heart rate formulas. You know, and almost every certification in the country, they're going to ask you to follow these formulas, maybe even have to memorize them. And the current science shows that there is no formula to determine heart rate zones, which is what you're trying to create here, that is accurate enough for you to be able to depend on it. I want you to be familiar with them because the history of exercise science has come through trying to simplify cardiovascular training to the point that uh, uh, being able to know your maximum or your threshold or uh, is something that you can do by math. You know, you can, I can, you can look at your body or at my body. You can't tell my body fat, my blood pressure, my uh, cholesterol level. None of that can you do with a formula. The only way is for us to go and measure it. 
So let me quickly go through them, and then I just want you to know that there is no scientific foundation behind them. There is no research. There is no formula that will work. They are useless. They are not useless for you to understand and know, and they may appear at some time on some tests that you have to take. So the first is, how do I measure my maximum heart rate? That's called the age-adjusted formula. It's very old school. It's 220 minus your age, and I'll give you an example. I'm 62 years old. If we took 220 and we took away my age minus, let's just give myself a break here, 60, it would say that my maximum heart rate, which it should be 160 beats a minute. My maximum heart rate is 195 beats a minute when I run Maximum heart rate is sport specific, so I have a different max for biking and swimming, and I love inline skating and snowshoeing and winter sports as well as summer sports, as, um, as I am a cross-training cardiovascular um, advocate, and I hope you are too. So that's a 35 beat air, and 35 heartbeats to set my zones is too big an air for anyone to use. Another is the Carvonin formula. The Carvonin formula brings in resting heart rate into the, the formula, but again, it starts with the first number in that formula, maximum heart rate. So you take 220 minus your age, that's invalid. You subtract your resting heart rate, it changes based on fitness, and you get a, something called heart rate reserve, which I just want you to understand the concept. So then you need to, after you have a, a maximum heart rate or a threshold heart rate established, you want to set some training zones, and you're going to typically do that as a percentage of an anchor point. You know, there was an old concept, and I want to get rid of some of the old myths in training, called the target training zone, and that doesn't exist at all. In fact, there is not one zone for people to train in. There's multiple training zones, and in each one of those zones, you're going to experience, get a different benefit. In each of the five training zones that are pretty standardized in cardiovascular, you're going to burn a different amount of fuel. You're going to get a different health benefit. You're going to do different kinds of workouts. You're going to burn different amounts of calories, and it's going to give you different benefits. So get rid of, let's get rid of the old science. Let's move into the new way of training. There's multiple zones that get multiple benefits. There's different ways to determine them, but there's no mathematical formula that works today. Perceived exertion has been the uh, basic way that most personal trainers have been training. They will take a, a chart, such as the chart that you're seeing um, in your power in this uh, slideshow, and it starts with a number. Um, we're going to 0 to 10 or 0 to 20. It doesn't matter which system that you use. And we'll just for this discussion use 0 to 10. 0 is no activity at all. And 10 is when you're going at your maximum. And you typically want to um, give your clients different in exercise intensities on different days because the way human physiology works is I want to stress it and I want to let it recover. And I want to stress and I want to let it adapt. And I want to give it more training load and I want to get it fitter. So the way to do it using rating of perceived exertion, it's called RPE, is to use workouts based on numerical uh, descriptions of the intensity. So let's look at um, the, the RPE number five, where it's called strong, heavy, hard. Strong, heavy, hard in a percentage system is about 60 to 70 percent of your maximum heart rate, 70 to 80 percent of your threshold heart rate, and it's called moderate activity. It's a little harder than moderate. You're going pretty strong, and I use running because I love to run as an example. And it is sustainable because for most individuals, an RPE of five is in that aerobic range. I haven't crossed over where I'm not able to sustain it. You rarely are going to take your clients to an um, eight, nine, or 10. That's pretty high intense. If you're working with athletes, they are typically athletes. We are uh, high intensity junkies. We love high intensity exercise and we feel better when we're doing it. So you have to determine what your client's goals are what their current level of fitness, what risks you have, and do ex cardiovascular exercise prescription based on a mechanism, whether it's RPE, and there's about 10 of these different ways of measuring exercise intensity. Perceived exertion is one of those. Another one of those, and zones are sometimes set on, is max VO2. And I, 
I explained it earlier, but I'm going to go through it one more time. Max VO2 is the amount of, maximum amount of oxygen that you can consume at one time. And the only way to accurately measure it is to put a gas analyzer on. And uh, uh, there's a, going to be a computer, a gas analyzer, and uh, we're going to have some kind of an exercise equipment because it's very specific to the type of exercise you're doing. So your VO2 max, your volume of oxygen at max, for swimming is different than at bicycling, it's different than than uh, cycling. But it is one of the best indicators that we have for cardiorespiratory, which is the heart and lungs endurance, and for measuring your current level of fitness. There's some other um, valuable um, uh, data points that you get out of taking a VO2 max test. You can find out how many calories you're burning, how many calories in each of those zones. You can measure how fit you are compared to other individuals. Uh, VO2 max is also a way to, comp when I said compare, you can take a male who's 50 years, uh, actually we'll use a male who's 37 years old, his VO2 max is typically on a fit individual is between 40 and 50 milliliters per kilogram per minute, uh, where a, a star champion, Lance Armstrong, for example, on a bike has been measured at just over 80 milliliters per kilogram per minute. So. Um, those are the, uh, depending on your fitness level, your class of athlete, and um, uh, your ability to process oxygen, um, it typically changes. And what causes it to change the most is good, strong cardiovascular exercise compliance and prescription. So this is a really good graph to show you what happens with oxygen consumption as I go faster and faster. And faster and faster is simply a way of saying I increase intensity. So as I go faster, and you can look at speed is on the, the horizontal axis, uh, you can see in, the re in this case the individual has red boxes that they peak out at a VO2 of about 30 and a speed of about uh, just shy of 12 miles per hour. And then you get fitter and fitter and fitter and your VO2 max goes higher and higher and higher. And that's one of your primary jobs as a personal trainer who specializes in cardiovascular, which everyone should, is to increase your client's VO2. And there are several ways to measure that. And one of the best ways to measure that is to use a gas a system where you're measuring gas, but you can also do field tests that estimate VO2. Here's another way to set training zone, intensity zones, and that's by you measuring blood lactate. Now this doesn't typically happen in clubs, but particularly clubs in America where drawing blood uh, sometimes is controlled by uh, law that you have to have certain credentials to be able to do that. But you, uh, there are uh, lactate analyzers and they prick your finger or your earlobe and draw a little bit of blood out and put it on a little piece of paper like a litmus paper and it measures millimoles of lactate at different intensity levels. And this slide is a really good example. There is a point, and actually there are two points, LT1 and LT2. Lactate threshold 1, that's the low threshold, and lactate threshold 2, which is high threshold. And what you're looking at in this slide is LT1, where that curve, where acidosis in the blood, which is what lactate is measured at, uh, begins to rise exponentially rather than linear. So you can see in the treadmill speed of 4, 5, 6, 8, 10, uh, speed is increasing, but lactate is not, and there is a point, a biomarker, a measurable, um, a quantifiable uh, marker where lactate shifts, and that will change as you get fitter. And here's a real good, if you turn to the next slide, a real good example. It's called shifting the graph to the right amongst ex uh, exercise sciences. It can be measured with lactate. It can also be measured with oxygen. And it is the same phenomenon. Both of those points um, uh, happen at about the same heart rate. So that's what we're trying to do. You're, you're gonna, what you're going to try to do is couple this low threshold and this high threshold using lactate or oxygen with heart rate because that's what we have available to our clients. Uh, lactate removal is the ability to de lower the acidosis of the blood by having the capacity to be able to shuttle, it's called lactate shuttle it, 
principally to the liver and the brain to be able to reduce the acidosis of that blood. And you'll see that there's two ways, in, in, and it happens in recovery. So when I'm recovering, there's two different kinds of recovery. There's passive recovery. I'm exercising, I stop. There's active recovery. I'm exercising, and I keep moving. And recovery quite often happens faster using active recovery. Okay, now let's just take one single workout in one single day, and let's break it into the different parts of what am I going to do with my client. And this is the beginning of writing an exercise workout program, a plan for what your client is going to be doing cardiovascularly on Tuesday in week three of your personal training sessions. So the first is, an, and there are typically four parts and sometimes five parts to every individual workout. The first one's called warm-up. So from now on, all of your clients want to warm up, and there are lots of reasons to warm up. It's about getting flexibility. It's about getting in sync. It's about increasing the, your core temperature so that your, your muscles work better. And the best way to do that is get your blood flowing, that heart pumping. The second is a phase is typically skills and drills. I want you really to stay with your client during cardiovascular training. Don't ditch them. They're expecting you to do that, and the highest level of personal trainer stays and works with their clients on their biomechanics in the sports in which they're doing, and constantly giving them suggestions and feedback, drills and skills of how to do that activity to be more efficient. And a lot of times that's called economy. We'll get into that in another day. So after doing a phase, you typically 10% of the time is warm up, 10% of the exercise time is skills and drills, 10% is, is the, the main set. It's a conditioning phase. What type of workout am I going to do? Steady states, continuous exercise, am I going to do intervals, am I going to do uh, bricks or combinations inside one workout, I'm going to have some steady state and some uh, interval training, or am I going to do a, what's called a recovery workout? Recovery workouts are low intensity, they're below threshold, and they're a time to really improve your aerobic foundation. The last, typically that time, the conditioning phase is about 70% of your total time. So let's say you have 30 minutes. I wish you had an hour, and hopefully you can engage your client to Commit to that in cardiovascular training because we're going to, you burn so many calories, you get so much benefit out of every minute of cardiovascular training. And that 30 minutes, 10% is warm up. So about three minutes warm up. Skills and drills is about 10%. That's another three minutes. Now 70% of your time is the main set. And the main set is the workout type, the steady state, the recovery, the fart, like the interval. And then the last 10% is cool down. And, and that's another about three minutes. And some people need longer cool downs and longer warm ups. And you have to find out because every individual is different. And you have to create a cardiovascular training program to meet their differences. And the value of cool down is really, really important to get them back to a steady state and um, back to able to go do their next activity. Exercise prescription also, there's some guidelines, and those guidelines are typically set by the American College of Sports Medicine. There are other bodies that also give those guidelines, and they're based in part on the age of your client and on their, their athletic background. So if they've been sedentary for a long time, the exercise prescription um, is different than if they have uh, been active for a long time. But it always includes warm-up, a time in um, preferably the aer higher aerobic zones three to five times a week, and if possible, more often because the value of cardiovascular exercise is being more and more understood that we need to get people up, out, and going. Intervals. You say, okay, I want us now put a, add some interval workouts to, the, to my uh, workouts for my client. How am I going to do that? And there are different kinds of intervals, and it's typically a ratio of high intensity to low intensity. And it's re repeats. So you'll say, I'm going to do two sets of 10 repeats at zone 4, 70 to 80% of maximum heart rate, with two minutes in the zone and one minute into recovery. 
I might do that for um, a set of 6 to 12, and I want to I measure that. So how am I going to measure it? I can use rating of perceived exertion. I could use a heart rate data, or I could use their ability to be able to talk. It's a ventilatory threshold that I can measure. And as I'm doing that, there's lots of, of creativity involved. And the creativity piece comes from varying the workout time, the amount of rest, the type of recovery. So there are lots of um, different kinds of interval workouts, more, more than you can put in a book. Uh, so variety is one of the keys to doing intervals. What kind of equipment do you need to be able to do? And you know, almost any piece of cardiovascular equipment will work. Uh, from a outdoors, uh, using steps um, and uh, using a track, indoors using bikes, ellipticals, rowing, wave machines. Uh, but the key is to keep your client moving all of the time during the session and try to engage as many large muscles, large muscles of the butt and the legs and the upper body, because those are the, the, the muscles that are the major prime movers. So if you say, what are the requirements for good endurance for performance, it is not one thing. I can't say, gee, you have a high VO2. You're going to be the best at this race, because it's more complicated than looking at one index of performance. There are lots of them, and they begin with aerobic capacity, VO2 max, with the ability to process lactate and to move um, LT, lactate threshold, which is really just a threshold point, which is a crossover between aerobic and non-aerobic activity. I want to move that up. I want to shift that curve to the right that, that you saw on the graph. Economy of effort is the ability to be able to go further on less calories and less oxygen, I'm efficient. And um, the, per, the type of muscles you have, type one or type two, slow twitch and fast twitch, and what the ratio of those muscles are. And there's about 15% of those muscles that can be changed depending on if you're doing uh, high speed work or you're doing endurance activities. There are some things you really do need to be aware of that are potentially harmful practices uh, in cardiovascular um, activity. And they, they are body position and using muscles that contract in the right way, uh, 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 exercising in temperatures that are inappropriate, they're too cold or they're too hot, uh, asking someone to do high intensity exercise when their immunity system is compromised and they're sick, uh, training and adding load when someone is already in an overtraining state and there are ways to to acknowledge and to see that someone is overtrained, um, uh, asking them to exercise when they're injured or asking them to do too many repetitions when they're not ready for it, and adding weight. There you'll see hand weights and body weights and, and vests, and uh, for some that's just not appropriate.